Wednesday, September 27th. The coach wouldn't let Victor practice today because of his stitches. He stomped away, threatening to go home and pull, him, pull them out himself. Once again, I got put in his place. I had a couple of opportunities to score against Chandra, but I didn't. Victor returned near the end of practice, carrying a big super gulp from the 7-Eleven. He stood down in the far goal where I usually stand, and as usual, the ball never went there. He started to get on Joey's case, telling him to stop standing around doing nothing. But the coach soon noticed him and told him to get out of there. After practice, I got my bag and started walking with Joey when Victor fell into step behind us. His boys, of course, were right behind him. Hey, fisherman, since you're me now, do you want a drink of my big gulp? No, thank you, Victor. What? You too good to drink out of my big gulp? Yes, I am. Tino Hernando and Mano started laughing. Victor smiled and continued. Hey, fisherman, why is this boy always following you around? I glanced at Joey. He was looking straight ahead. I don't know, Victor. Why don't you ask him? Victor tapped Joey on the, sho on his sh on the shoulder with his cup. Hey, yo. Why are you following Fisherman around all the time? Joey looked upset. He didn't know how to handle this. I smiled to show him that Victor was just messing around, but he wouldn't even look at me and he wouldn't answer. I knew things were about to get worse. Victor tapped him again a little harder. His voice got a little louder. Yo, I said, why are you following Fisherman around all the time? You his boyfriend or something? Joey turned toward him angrily. No, I'm not. Victor ignored him and started on me. Fisherman, you can't take two steps without this boy following you. What's up with that? Is he some kind of fish, maybe? Does he hope you're going to catch him? Get it? Because he's a fisher, right? Um, the boys behind Victor were getting into it now. Victor turned to Tino and said, What's that fish your daddy has the picture of? You know, that fish picture that's hanging up in the hut? Dino shook his head. What are you talking about? Your daddy has that old magazine ad on the wall making fun of Dio Carlos. Dino thought about it and then yelled out, Sorry, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, that's the dude. Sorry, Charlie. Charlie the tuna. He's always trying to get caught. He's always hanging around trying to get on that hook, right? He poked Joey again. Is that you? Are you Charlie the Tuna? The boys were laughing wildly now. I spoke in a calm voice to Joey. Just chill out. But he wouldn't chill out. He was letting it get to him. Victor kept after him. Starkists don't want tunas with good taste, Charlie. They want tunas that taste good. The boys were laughing like maniacs now and slapping hands. Do you understand the difference, my man? Joey continued to stare straight ahead and his face red, his jaw clenched. We all reached the green pickup truck and the boys piled into the back, still laughing about Joey. We continued on through, the, on through the school. He didn't say a word until we were standing out at the curb. So what was that supposed to mean? Some kind of initiation or something? Yeah, yeah, don't take it so seriously. That's just Victor. Did he ever mess with you like that? Sure, on the first day I went out for the team. And then he stopped? Yeah, yeah, sure, he stopped. Joey stared down the street looking for mom's car. I didn't have the heart to tell him the rest of it. Victor might stop messing with him, but his name will be Charlie the Tuna from here on out. Mom pulled up and Joey hopped into the back seat without a word. I got in the front and noticed that mom was staring at something ahead of us. She pulled up 10 more yards to where Maya and Nito were standing. She rolled down the window and smiled and said, hello girls. Maya smiled back. Hello, how are you? There was an awkward silence until mom said, so how is it playing against these boys? I'm not sure Maya understood the question. She answered, well, yes, some of them are quite good players. I think it's great you have a co-ed team. I really do. Thank you. 
Mom rolled the window back up and pulled away. I said, what was that all about? I just wanted to encourage those girls a little. No wonder Maya seemed confused. I said, Mom, Maya doesn't need too much encouragement. She's the top scorer in the county. Numero uno, she's, she'll make the all-county team for sure. Mom's jaw dropped. Are you serious? That tall girl? She'll be on the all-county boys team? Yes, so will Chandra if she doesn't get hurt. Well, that's fantastic. Does Mr. Donnelly know about this? Mr. Donnelly? Mr. Donnelly from the Tangerine Times. This should be in the newspaper. Don't you think so, Joey? Joey was sulking pretty heavily, pretty heavily in the back. I don't think he even heard her. We drove the rest of the way in silence. We turned into the entranceway to Lake Windsor Downs and then onto Joey Street. It was a weird sight. The houses on either side of his were completely covered by huge bright blue tents. They had signs posted all around them. Danger, poison gas. Mom tried to make eye contact with him in the rear view mirror. Joey, why are your neighbors getting their houses tented? They gotta get fumigated, he said, fumigated for bugs. We've all got bugs. You all do? Your house too? Yeah, the whole street, I think. What kind of bugs? Oh, I don't know, roaches, termites. So are you getting one of these tents put over your house? Yeah, next week, I think. We pulled into Joey's driveway and I could see the tents better now. They were really big pieces of blue canvas tied together with ropes to hold in the poison fumes. Mom said, how long do you have to stay away when they fumigate? Two days. Well, you're welcome to stay with us. You and Paul do everything else together. You may as well sleep together. Right, Paul? I thought to myself, perfect, Mom. The perfect thing to say under the circumstances. Joey got that upset look on his face again. He muttered, I don't think so, and went inside. Mom turned to me, what's wrong with him? Why wouldn't he wanna to come to our house? I shrugged and said, I don't know, but of course I do know. Joey hasn't set foot in our house since the day he met up with Eric and Arthur. He will probably never set foot in it again, but mom could never understand that. For Joey, our house may as well be covered with canvas and bound by ropes because it's filled with poison. Friday, September 29th. Joey didn't show up for practice yesterday, but someone else did. We had been loosening up for about 10 minutes. The starters, including Victor, were taking shots at Chandra in the goal. The subs, including me, were kicking a ball around in a circle. I looked over toward the bus lanes and saw a white van pulling in. It had two high-tech looking antennas on top, one on the back that looked like a corkscrew and one in the middle that swiveled. Anyway, this van kept driving right off the blacktop and over the grass toward our field. When it got closer, I could see that Tangerine Times was printed on the side. I suddenly got a sick feeling. Mom had actually done it. She had called Mr. Donnelly about our team, or at least the girls on our team. The van pulled up next to Betty Bright's car, her 1967 yellow and white Mustang. A young guy with long hair and a big camera hanging around his neck jumped out of the driver's side. He set a black leather case down on the back of the Mustang. Mr. Donnelly got out of the other side. He had on a blue suit and carried a small notebook. He walked straight up to the coach who was on the sideline talking to Dolly. I drifted toward them to hear what they would say. It was obvious that Mr. Donnelly and Betty Bright knew each other. She shook hands with him and gave him a big smile. She stopped smiling pretty fast though when she saw the long haired guy's case on her car. She started walking over there just as the photographer closed in on Nita and Maya and started taking pictures. Mr. Donnelly walked with her, opening his notebook. He said, I understand that you have a couple of pretty special players on your team this year. The coach took the photographer's bag and dumped it on the ground. She said, uh-huh, and who would that be? 
Mr. Donnelly flipped back a few pages in his notebook. A girl named Maya and a girl named Chandra, they're, they're both supposed to make the all-county boys team. When Dolly heard this, she yelled over, Hey, Chandra, they want to talk to you, girl. Chandra had been focused on the shooters all this time. When she heard Dolly, she looked over puzzled, and then she spotted the Tangerine Times van and the long-haired guy with his camera. A look of terror came over her face. She spun around on her heels and sprinted away right out of the goal across the field, across the bus lanes and into the school. Everybody stopped what they were doing and watched her go. Now that there was no one in the goal, Victor walked up to the photographer and announced, you must be here to interview me. I'm Victor Guzman, the captain of the first place Tangerine Middle School War Eagles. How do you do? The guy looked over at Mr. Donnelly and then he said, excuse me, and tried to get around Victor, but Victor blocked him and added, you'll probably want to take some action shots of me before you do anything else. The photographer stared at him dumbly, and then he stepped back and lined up a picture of Victor, who struck a pose and smiled. The camera flashed, and Victor added, that's, Vic that's Victor Guzman. You know, how, you know how to spell that? G-U-Z-M-A-N. Don't you go spelling my name wrong, or I'll have to mess you up. Hernando, Dino, and Mano uh, crowded in front of the photographer next, telling him their names and demanding that he take their pictures. The guy looked over at Mr. Donnelly, who signaled at him to go ahead and do it. Mr. Donnelly said, look, Betty, I'm sorry for disrupting your practice. Can I just get the last names of the girls? The coach wasn't looking at him, and she was not happy. This is more disruptive than you could know, Mr. Donnelly. If you want to run a picture of our team, you should show Victor he's our captain. Mr. Donnelly replied, but he's not news, coach. Having girls on your team is news. Not really. I've had girls on this team for five years. Why is it suddenly news? Mr. Donnelly held up his hands to explain, and the coach looked at him. You're the first place team in the county. You have the top scorer in the county. She's a girl. The coach nodded. All right, fair enough. Her name is Maya Pandi, P-A-N-D-H-I. You wrote that down, great. And what about Chandra? You never mind about Chandra. She doesn't want any part of newspapers or publicity. So that's the way it's gonna be. Mr. Donnelly nodded, okay. I'll certainly respect her wishes. They shook hands again. The guy with the long hair saw this and broke away from the boys. He grabbed his bag and climbed into the driver's seat of the van and the two of them drove back the way they came. Betty Bright watched them go and then walked slowly across the field and into the school. Victor sat down, so the rest of us did too. Finally, the coach and Chandra came walking out. By the time Chandra was back in goal to start the scrimmage, we had lost about 20 minutes of practice time. Like I said, that all happened yesterday. This morning, I looked in the Tangerine Times in the back of the sports section. There was no article about our team, but there was a photo, the wrong photo. It was a photo of Nita Shirali with the caption, Maya Pandi leads all scorers in Tangerine County. Good going, Mom. Monday, October 2nd. I'm in classes with Teresa, Thino, Maya, Nita, and Henry D. all day. Now Joey has joined that group. The first and last periods of the day, science and language arts, do a cross-curricular project together. That means we do a science-type project in science class and we write about it in language arts. I came in at the tail end of the last project, so all I could do was sit and listen to kids read their reports. They were really good. Now we're starting a new cross-curricular project. Mrs. Potter passed out a project sheet that describes what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, and how we're supposed to present it to the class. At the top of the project sheet, it says, science, language arts, cross-curricular project, broad topic, Florida agriculture, narrow topic, an agricultural product that is native to this area of Florida. Your topic, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. 
Mrs. Potter gave us 24 hours to form our own groups of four to six kids. After that, she would form new groups out of the leftovers, as she called them. I was looking over the project sheet with Joey when I saw Tino walk back toward us. He stopped at Henry D's desk and said, yo, Henry, you want to be in a group with Teresa and me? We got a hot idea. Henry D, whose real name is Henry Dilks, is a quiet country boy, always polite. He said, thank you, I'd be pleased to. Dito, uh, Tino, Tino bumped his fist down on top of Henry's and started back toward his desk. I called out to him, hey Tino, how about me and Joey, can we be in your group? Tino stopped and looked at me, surprised. He thought a minute and said, yeah, why not? But it's our group, you got that? Yeah, yeah, I got that. He turned to his seat and Joey said to me, what did you do that for? Do what? We gotta get in a group, right? I don't, I don't wanna be a leftover. So why don't we form our own group? With who? We need four to six people. With anybody, anybody but him. He shot an angry look at Tino. Come on, man. Henry's nice, super nice. So is Teresa and, and Tino's okay when he's by himself. Joey shook his head, he didn't believe me. That guy's bad news, I don't need this. I don't need this at all. Hey, this isn't soccer practice, it's science class. You're an ace in science, right? Joey glared at me. What are you saying, that I stink in soccer? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this is different. This is something that you're really good at. Joey finally agreed doubtfully. All right, all right, good. This will give you another kind of chance with people, you know? A chance to get in with some of the people from the team. There was a strange pause, Joey finally said. I'm not on the team anymore. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Since when? I turned in my uniform this morning. I looked at him, but he wouldn't look back. I finally said, that's it? You're just not on the team anymore and that's it? Joey tightened up, yeah, that's it, so what? What's it to you? It's nothing to me, I just don't understand. I, I thought you wanted to play soccer. Well, I don't, not here anyway. He finally looked at me, not anywhere. I'm gonna play football when I get to high school. You understand that? I understood. I said, okay and I was willing to leave it right there. But Joey wasn't. He was practically snarling now. I can't believe I let you talk me into this. He gestured around the room. I let you talk me into coming into this dump. I suddenly became aware of the other kids around us as he went on. This place is like the darkest Africa, like the Amazon jungle, like, we're learning to live among the natives here. I took in the ugliness of Joey's words and I saw for the first time how different he was from me. Different parents, different friends, different brother. The speaker came on and the gong sounded. I had to say something so I muttered, I'm sorry you feel like that, and headed out without him into the crowded hallway. Tuesday, October 3rd. There's something I forgot to record here about Joey's first day at Tangerine Middle School. Or maybe I didn't forget. Maybe I just wanted to block it out. After what he said yesterday, I can't. The scene came back to me today on the way home. It was last Monday, I was sitting in homeroom and suddenly Joey walked in and handed Mrs. Pollard a pass. He was all by himself, no Teresa to show him around like I had hoped. Miss Pollard told him to take a seat, so he came back and sat next to, sat next to me. He was all smiles and said something like, hey, so far so good. I said, where's Teresa? Who? Teresa, Teresa Cruz, I told you to ask for her as a guide. Oh yeah, she's back in the office, I saw her there. What? Is she guiding somebody else today? Nah, I just said I don't need it. What do I need a guide dog for? A guide dog? You're calling Teresa a guide dog? Joey laughed. Come on, man, lighten up. What? Do you think she's good looking? I thought about that. Yeah, I guess I do. 
Joey still had that cocky smile plastered on his face. And you've been here too long. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I just shook my head. I finally said, I gotta tell you, you're coming in here with the wrong attitude. Hey, what's the big deal? I got here okay without a guide, right? You'd have to be blind to get lost in this place. Oh, is that right? So now you're calling me blind. No, I'm not calling you blind. You're calling Teresa a dog. No, I'm just pointing out she's not my type. The bell rang for first period. All I had time to say was, don't do this. Don't come in here with attitude. Like I said, that scene came back to me today. We had our first meeting for science project. Each group of kids pulled their desks together. The leftover kids then got into their own groups. Joey and I pulled our desks into a circle with Henry D, Teresa, and Tino, and I was surprised when Teresa, not Tino, took charge of the meeting. And it was obvious that she had done this sort of thing before. Teresa began by reading the assignments out loud. To research and present information about an agricultural product that is native to this area of Florida. Then she passed out a glossy one-page ad with a picture of a citrus tree laden with fruit. When we heard this assignment, Tino and I knew right away what we were going to write about. I just gave you all an advertisement for an agricultural product that was developed by our brother, Luis. It's a new variety of citrus that he has named the Golden Dawn Tangerine. This tangerine is seedless, very juicy, and very resistant to cold weather, which makes it perfect for this area. Luis thinks it could even return this area to its former prominence as the tangerine capital of the world. He just got it registered with the state this year as a new variety. Now he is starting to market it to citrus growers in Florida, California, and Mexico. So our report is going to be called the Golden Dawn Tangerine. Teresa passed out sheets of paper that had our report title typed across the top. She said, what we want to do today is, divide, is to divide up the research part of the project. Tino and I will concentrate on Luis's invention and what he had to do to register it with the state. Somebody else can do the history of the citrus industry in this area. Henry, we thought you could do that part, you know. When did citrus growing start here? What are the types of trees that grow best here? That kind of thing. Henry D nodded and jotted something down. Then Teresa turned to me. Somebody else could do basic research on what a tangerine is and how it is grown. We thought that you and your friend could handle that. I nodded. Teresa added, any questions? Henry D said, excuse me, how long did it take for your brother to invent this tangerine? Tino answered, his whole life. I can't remember a time when Luis wasn't working on this, and I don't know if Teresa made this clear or not, but this is really a big deal. It's like inventing a new kind of medicine or something. Luis is going to be famous for doing this. Teresa said, Luis is real interested in helping us too. He'll answer questions and he'll show us how it's all done. We figure it'll, we'll get all this research in and then we'll have an organizational meeting, probably with Luis. Then each group can write its section of the report and give it to me and I'll type it all up. Joey interrupted her, just, just put it on a disc and give it to me. I'll run it off on the laser, desk, laser jet at home. Teresa looked away. She seemed flustered. She said, we, we don't have a computer. We use a typewriter. Tino snapped at him. Got a problem with that, Tuna? Joey stared him down. No, I don't have a problem with that. I guess I got a problem with you. Yeah? You're going to have a big problem with me. Bigger than you know, chump. I felt I had, I had to head this off, so I said, come on, you guys, forget this. Shut up, Tino snarled, his eyes still locked on Joey's. Joey, I said, this is Tino's group, right? We agreed that when you joined. Joey stood up and moved his desk back. He looked at me with disgust. You agreed to that. You'd agree to anything, not me. I'm joining another group. He started to drag his desk away, but then he stopped and looked at Tino, adding sarcastically, not that your brother and his new type of banana aren't fascinating. 
Tino jumped up and lunged at him, but Joey was too fast. He leaned back and Tino flew past him, landing on the desks of the next group. Mrs. Potter was there before he could recover. She got a grip on Tino's arm and hustled him out into the hallway. Joey turned on me. Is this how you get by here, right? You kiss up to those guys? You're scared of those guys. What are you talking about? I'm not scared. You're a gutless wonder fisher. You're afraid of girls. You're afraid of your own brother and now you're afraid of these low lowlifes. They treat you like a dog and you take it. Take it, you like it, you think they're your friends. Everyone's eyes are on Joey. He was red-faced and angry. Let me tell you something. You're bigger than this little punk, you know that? And I'm bigger than you. If he ever messes with me again, I don't care where it is, I'm gonna punch him out. Mrs. Potter stepped back into the classroom and signaled for Joey to join her in the hall. He walked out and everyone's eyes turned to me. I had no clue what to do, I just stood there. Finally, Teresa broke the tension. So are you joining another group or what? I answered immediately. No, I wanna stay here. Teresa spoke to the class, then let's all sit down. I spent the rest of the period staring at a blank piece of paper, trying to sort out what had happened. Joey came back at the end of the period and sat with the leftover group behind me. Tino didn't come back at all. The word at practice was that he had been suspended for three days. The end of today's reading.